covalent substances are formed when atoms share pairs of electrons to fill their outer electron shell and become stable. The shared pair of electrons is a covalent bond, and it's the covalent bond, that shared pair of electrons, that holds the atoms together. And the covalent bonds between atoms are very strong, which means that they are very difficult to break. They, it requires a lot of energy to separate the atoms out from that covalent bond. And the type of atoms that form covalent bonds are non-metals. They bond together by sharing electrons. And this makes sense if you consider the fact that generally non-metals need to gain electrons to fill their outer shell that is usually almost full. And so if two atoms both need to gain electrons, the only way that they could do that is by sharing electrons, because they couldn't transfer electrons between one and the other, and then both have a full outer shell. There are three different types of covalently bonded substances that you need to know about. There are small molecules, sometimes referred to as simple molecules, very large molecules, for instance, things called polymers, and also giant covalent structures. The main focus of this video will be small molecules. We will return to the other two in separate videos. Hydrogen is a small covalent molecule with the formula H2. That means it's made up of two atoms of hydrogen. Hydrogen is in group one of the periodic table, which means it's got one electron in its outer shell. And remember, for that to be a full shell, it needs to have two electrons. And so we've got one atom of hydrogen with its electron shown as a dot and another atom of hydrogen with its electron shown as a cross. Remember, these circles are representing the outer shell of the atoms. When the covalent bond forms, those outer shells will overlap and where they overlap, the electrons in that area are being shared by the two atoms in the bond. And so this is a shared pair of electrons. And now each of those hydrogen atoms has a full outer shell of two electrons. We can show this as a more simple dot and cross diagram by simply getting rid of the electron shells and leaving behind that shared pair of electrons. And that's what I'm showing here on the left. Both of the diagrams are dot and cross diagrams, both valid in an exam, and both show that shared pair of electrons, the covalent bond. In a displayed formula, you don't show any of the electrons. You only represent the electrons that are being shared with a line. And so hydrogen in displayed formula is just a capital H with a big minus sign, that line connecting it to another atom of hydrogen. And so this is the displayed formula for hydrogen. And then a ball and stick diagram shows the atoms as circles. I'm using white circles here to represent hydrogen. And then there is a stick between these two atoms of hydrogen. And that stick is the covalent bond. Chlorine is in group seven of the periodic table, which means it will have seven electrons in its outer shell, and that shell can hold eight electrons. And so the chlorine on the left has got seven dots for its electrons, and then the second chlorine has got seven crosses for its electrons. When the covalent bond forms, those electron shells overlap, and now we have a pair of electrons between those two atoms of chlorine, and they get to count towards the total electrons in the outer shell of both of those chlorine atoms, and so they both have eight electrons in their outer shell. That shared pair of electrons, the covalent bond, but also three pairs of electrons that are not involved in bonding, but must definitely be shown. The simpler dot and cross diagram looks very similar, and it usually takes up much less space. We can see that we've still got that shared pair of electron. We've still got those three electron pairs not involved in bonding. We're just not showing the electron shells. The displayed formula is very similar to that of hydrogen. It's just two atoms of chlorine with a line between them. And then the ball and stick diagram has got two green atoms of chlorine shown as being connected by one covalent bond. Oxygen is in group six of the periodic table, meaning it's got six electrons in its outer shell. So I'm showing one atom of oxygen as having six electrons that are crosses and the other has got six dots. 
Now, this outer shell can hold eight electrons, so the oxygen atoms actually need to share two electrons each. And so when those shells overlap, we have in fact got four shared electrons in two pairs. And so this means that we are creating what is called a double covalent bond. Previously, the single lines, the single pair of electrons is a single covalent bond. Here we have got a double bond. And we can see the same picture for the dot and cross diagram, only without the shells. We're still showing four electrons in the middle in two pairs. That's the double covalent bond. And we've still got those four electrons on each of the oxygen atoms that are not involved in the bonding which is how those oxygen atoms have achieved a full shell by getting a total of eight electrons. The displayed formula looks a little bit different here. Instead of having one line between the two oxygen atoms, we have got two lines representing that double covalent bond. And similarly, in the ball and stick diagram, we would show two sticks between the two oxygen atoms representing those two shared pairs of electrons. Nitrogen is in group five of the periodic table, which means it's got five electrons in its outer shell. And since that outer shell can hold eight, that means that the nitrogen atoms actually need to share three electrons with each other. And so when those electron shells overlap, there are actually six electrons in that shared overlap zone where those electron shells meet. And so the nitrogen atoms have achieved eight electrons in their outer shell. They've got the six in the middle that they are sharing, but they have got two electrons of their own that they kept out of the bond. And so that gives them eight electrons in total. And we can see that again with the simpler dot and cross diagram, six electrons in the middle and one pair of electrons each not involved in bonding for each of those nitrogen atoms. The fact that we've got six electrons being shared, that means that we've got three pairs of electrons, which means that this is a triple bond between those two nitrogen atoms. And when we draw the displayed formula of a triple bond, we need to use three lines between those nitrogen atoms. And that is the same for the ball and stick diagram. I'm using blue circles to represent nitrogen and they are connected by three sticks representing those three shared pairs of electrons in that triple bond. Hydrogen chloride has got the formula HCl, which means it has one atom of hydrogen with one electron in its outer shell and one atom of chlorine with seven electrons in its outer shell. When those atoms bond together, the shells overlap and merge. And now that hydrogen has got a share in the two electrons in the middle, so its outer shell is now full. Chlorine has that shared pair of electrons, so that makes two, and it's also got three pairs of electrons not involved in bonding, so that takes chlorine up to eight electrons. And we can also see this in the simpler dot and cross diagram that doesn't show the shells. For the displayed formula, we just need one single line between the H and the Cl to show those atoms are bonded together by a single covalent bond. The ball and stick diagram has got one green atom for chlorine shown as being larger than the white atom of hydrogen and they're connected together by a single stick. Water has got the chemical formula H2O, which means it has two atoms of hydrogen, each with one electron in their outer shell, and one atom of oxygen with six electrons in its outer shell. When those atoms all come together to make the water molecule, you can see that we've got a covalent bond between one atom of hydrogen and the oxygen. That's a shared pair of electrons. And we have another shared pair of electrons between the other atom of hydrogen and the oxygen. And then oxygen has retained four of its electrons in two separate pairs, and they did not get involved in bonding because hydrogen only needed one additional electron. And then the simpler dot and cross diagram also clearly shows the two shared pairs of electrons in each of the bonds and the two non-bonding pairs of electrons. For the displayed formula for water, that has got two hydrogen atoms, each with a line pointing out from it to a central oxygen atom. And the ball and stick diagram communicates the similar idea with oxygen being shown as a red circle and the hydrogen as white circles, each with a single stick between the oxygen and the hydrogen. 
Methane is made up of one carbon atom from group four of the periodic table, so I'm showing that with four crosses, covalently bonded to four separate hydrogen atoms, each being shown with dots. When each of those hydrogen atoms moves into connection with the carbon, a covalent bond is formed where those shells overlap and we get a shared pair of electrons in that covalent bond. This happens four times in total, which means that the carbon atom has got eight electrons in its outer shell and each of those hydrogen atoms has got two. And you can see that in the simpler dot and cross diagram as well. The displayed formula looks a little bit more complicated than some of the others. We've got a carbon atom in the centre with four separate lines coming out from it. Each of those lines is representing a covalent bond between that carbon atom and the hydrogen atoms in the molecule. The ball and stick diagram for methane tries to show a bit of the three-dimensional nature of this shape. We've got the central carbon atom shown as a black circle and then four hydrogen atoms shown as white circles with sticks connecting to them. But you can see that two of these sticks are trying to show some perspective where this atom of hydrogen is coming out towards us out of the screen and the other atom of hydrogen is going away from us into the screen and these two are in the same plane as the screen. The nitrogen atom in ammonia has got five electrons in its outer shell that I'm showing as crosses, and the hydrogen atoms have got one electron in their outer shells, which I'm showing as dots. When those three hydrogen atoms join to the nitrogen, each by a separate covalent bond, you can see that we've got three shared pairs of electrons around that central nitrogen, giving that nitrogen six electrons, and then that extra pair that didn't get involved in bonding takes nitrogen up to the eight electrons that it needs. And and each hydrogen atom has got the two electrons that it needs to fill its outer shell because the first shell can only hold two. And we can see the same picture in the simpler dot and cross diagram. The displayed formula for ammonia has got nitrogen in its center and three hydrogen atoms sticking out from it. We typically show it like this with two of the hydrogen atom bonds being horizontal and one being vertical going downwards to the bottom. The ball and stick diagram shows the blue nitrogen atom in the centre and three sticks, so three covalent bonds coming out from that central nitrogen going to each of the three hydrogen atoms. Polymers are very large molecules made up of lots of repeating sections. Polymers are formed when lots of small molecules join together. A polymer molecule could contain thousands or millions or billions of atoms, and so there's no way that we could easily draw that out in full. And so instead, we represent polymers by drawing that part of it that repeats itself thousands and thousands of times. When we do this, we try to show the polymer in full displayed formula. And so in this instance here, I'm showing polyethene, or polythene it's sometimes called, which is made up of a repeating unit of two carbon atoms joined by strong covalent bonds, and each of those has got two strong covalent bonds to two hydrogen atoms. And so this is the section of the polymer of poly ethene that repeats itself lots of times. And we show that it repeats itself lots of times by putting it inside some brackets. And we put two covalent bonds, one either side of the polymer's repeat unit, that stretch out beyond the contents of the bracket and trail outside of those brackets. These are usually referred to as trailing bonds. We finish our representation of a polymer by putting a little n outside of those brackets in the bottom right hand position. And what this is representing is the number of times that this repeat unit repeats itself. And this can vary from one molecule to another. So we don't know what that number actually is, but we know it is a very large number. As a result of this, polymers don't have a definite molecular formula. We know n is a huge number, but we don't know what that number is. And all of the polymer chains might be constructed in the same way, but they're all different lengths. And so to show the molecular formula for polyethene, we would write C2H4, because that's the formula of the repeat unit, and then we would put brackets around it, and then we would write the n outside the brackets to show that that formula is repeating a huge number of times.
Some covalent substances exist as giant covalent structures. These are called giant structures because they're made up of a huge number of atoms. And they are giant covalent structures because those atoms are held together by a large number of strong covalent bonds. Examples of giant covalent structures include silicon dioxide, sometimes referred to as silica, which is the main component of sand and many rocks. Also, we have got graphite and diamond. Both of these last two are giant covalent structures made from carbon. The atoms in a giant covalent structure are arranged in a giant lattice. And giant, again, is referring to the huge number of atoms, and the lattice is referring to a regular repeating pattern within the covalent structure. In this giant lattice, each atom is bonded to several others in an extensive network that continues out into three dimensions. For example, I'm showing a small section of diamond here. Each of those black circles is representing a carbon atom. Each of those lines is representing a covalent bond between those carbon atoms. And so you can see that we've got a three-dimensional structure, sometimes called a tetrahedral, where the carbon atoms are connected to four other carbon atoms. The atoms at the edge don't look like they're connected to four other atoms, but that's because the section that I'm showing has to end somewhere. But this would continue off in three dimensions and each atom would have four bonds. As a result of this giant covalent structure, the substance themselves are very stable and they're very strong. In addition to that, they will usually have a high melting point and a high boiling point. And this means it will require a lot of energy to make that substance turn from a solid to a liquid or from a liquid into a gas. And this is due to those strong covalent bonds within the structure. Lots of energy is needed to break those strong covalent bonds. And so it only happens at a high temperature. And I'll go into greater depth about giant covalent structures in a separate video.